welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. This is our fifth podcast, and the support that I've received from listeners like you has been great. I appreciate your comments and suggestions about what you've heard, and if there's something that you would like addressed or someone you would like to hear from, please let me know. You can send me an email at bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com or you can visit the Band Talk Charlie Facebook page and leave a comment there. You know, it was on March 11 when the National Basketball Association player Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive for the coronavirus. And it was a matter of hours that the NBA suspended their season and the nation followed suit. Now we're hearing from more and more states that schools, as we remember them, are over for this academic year, and teachers will deliver the remainder of their instruction through various distance learning platforms. You know, during this time, I've been trying to find something to watch on television other than news of the coronavirus and all the related positioning and propaganda that is accompanying it. So I was flipping through the channels. And I came across a PBS station that was airing an episode of the new Ken Burns documentary on country music, and it immediately captured me. I went on and purchased the entire series, and my wife and I began to take the next eight evenings, and we viewed every episode. To put it simply, it is fantastic. It is so well done. The artistry and storytelling, the dialogue, the interviews, some of the greatest photographs you will ever see and the various performances of country music. I just can't recommend it enough. And as I do with most everything I watch or read, I keep a notepad with me so I can write down some things I want to remember. And this country music documentary had so many memorable lines. And one I feel is so important as we all wrap our arms around teaching our students from a distance. And it has to do with the element of doubt that we all deal with. The line was simple. If you're not going to believe in yourself, who will? Well, that question has two answers. As a teacher, we have to believe in ourselves, and hopefully we have the life experiences to help us do just that, believe in ourselves. But the second part comes from the side of the student. Our second interview today is with a former student of mine who I'll introduce a bit later. And he said something to me that has stuck since the time we did the recording. He said, You believed in me before I believed in myself. Wow, that may be the highest compliment I have ever been paid as a teacher. And as I thought about it more and more, I realized that yes, that is the job of the teacher. You have to believe in every student. You have to believe that every student can learn. And yes, you have to believe that every student can learn through distance learning. It may not be what you had hoped, You're not able to see them face to face. And probably the thing that pains you the most is that you can't stand on the podium and make music in real time. No more rehearsals or concerts. But your students can and your students will learn because you believe in yourself and you believe in them. Today's podcast is going to feature two segments. The first is with Jeff Connor, trumpet player and leader of the Boston Brass. I had the honor to have the Boston Brass open our Midwest Clinic concert with the Vandercook Band in 2003. 
though during the course of the interview, neither one of us could remember the date. But I do remember that performance very well. And I remember them performing Wayside Festival. It was an outstanding way to start a concert. In addition to being a great musician and trumpet player, Jeff is just a great person. He's a soft-spoken giant. He's one of these folks that pushes others out in front so they can shine. I hope you were able to hear the Boston Brass at the 2019 Midwest Clinic, where they blew the roof off the place on Thursday evening and then presented a truly masterful clinic on Friday. I know you will enjoy our conversation. The second part of today's podcast is a former student of mine, John Armato. Now, I had better get this right because while we were talking, I could not correctly articulate his title for the life of me. But John is senior partner and creative strategist for the Fleshman Hillard Public Relations Firm, and he's based in Sacramento, California. He's going to share some lessons that he's carried with him from high school band into the corporate world. I know you're going to enjoy that one, too. It's going to be a great show, and I'm so glad that you're listening. We'll be right back. Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is made possible through the support of Hal Leonard, Eastman Musical Instruments, Con Selmer, and Vandercook College of Music. So joining us for this segment of Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is a gentleman who has become a dear friend since the first time we had an opportunity to work. Gosh, it's been 10 or 15 years ago. His name is Jeff Connor, and Jeff is... Uh, the leader and uh, trumpet player in the wonderful ensemble, the Boston Brass. Jeff, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me, Charlie. It's a pleasure. I, I'm trying to recall. It had to be, gosh, it had to be uh, 15 years ago when the Boston Brass opened up our concert at the Midwest Clinic, and it was uh, really exciting and invigorating. And how long had you... Uh, as an ensemble, been been together uh, then, if you can remember. Well, the group started back in 1986, uh, and that's uh-huh. when I was a student, a graduate student at Boston University. Uh, so that, that's when the group started, just a group of friends that enjoyed playing chamber music together. Uh, we were incredibly fortunate to have as our first teachers and coaches and mentors uh, the Empire Brass. They were artists in residence at Boston University back then. And uh, their tuba player, of course, at the time was Sam Palafian. So Sam was our, I mean, really first teacher and coach and mentor. And, you know, looking back then, I never would have imagined that 25, 28 years later, Sam would become a member of Boston Brass. And Sam played with us four or five years. So we are so incredibly, you know, fortunate to have Sam with us. And then we've um, had the privilege of playing with, with the Vandercook uh, Win Ensemble a couple times at Midwest. Uh, so we, we have uh, great warmth for, for, that, uh, for that school. Well, thank you. And, and, and they continue to get better and better. Uh, not Vandercook. Well, they do too, I hope. But the Boston Brass does. Uh, this past December, you guys put on an incredible performance at the Midwest Clinic. And, and I even thought, the one better than your performance and your performance is great because you had all these uh, wonderful artists joining you, but was your clinic the next day. And I thought that clinic was just over the top. Oh, well, thank you so much, Charlie. That, that really means a lot. That, that's something that we've really over the last oh, probably eight or nine years really become, you know, kind of a central focus to the group is, and, and that's something that we learned from Sam uh, is, you know, no matter where we are in the world is to leave as big a footprint as we can. So that outreach of music education, that outreach of working with students is something that has become really important for the group. Uh, and, you know, in terms of just the, the, the legacy of, of, of the band. Uh, so having the opportunity to work with middle school, high school, college, professionals, uh, students, uh, working with, with uh, educators uh, is, is something that we really enjoy and find that's you know, really important. So, and we appreciate everybody that came out to the clinic you know, as well. Well, it was wonderful. And I had a chance to see another clinic that you did actually at Vandercook probably two years ago now. And, and I was mm-hmm. just so impressed because 
each one of you have an incredible story to tell. And the one I, I, I keep retelling is, uh, is your wonderful horn player, Chris uh, Castellanos. Mm-hmm. I believe that's his name. Uh-huh. Right? Yep, and he that's talked it, about yep. being, a, being a kid in his junior high school and he wanted to get better and he wasn't playing on a very good horn. And I remember him saying, my teacher told me, if I want to get better to go home with my horn, and all he needed to do was to open the case and set it on his bed. And and I laughed at that. And he says, of course, you know, I had to start playing it. And that's miraculously. But that's the first better. step. That's the first yeah. step. You know, you take it, you take your instrument home, you take it out of the case and you put it on your bed or in, you know, in the living room or the kitchen table or someplace where it's just always looking at you. <laughs> so it's like you pass it and it's like, oh, I should pick, I should pick you up. <laughs> yeah. and everybody has a story to tell so what so tell us your story how did you get started well i would not be talking to you today uh if it was not for my middle school and high school band director uh and no matter uh, no matter where we are in in, in the world uh, and especially in the in the u.s um every, at every concert i always thank my middle school and high school band director and also just music educators, all music educators just talk about how important they are and how they're making the world a better place. Uh, But I grew up outside of Boston, uh, about 45 minutes. I had a very traditional uh, music education upbringing, you know, played in middle school band and jazz band. And then in high school was in everything, you know, jazz band and wind ensemble and orchestra and I uh, just had a great time. I mean, we I had great band directors and good ensembles, and um, you know, we had we had a marching band, but it was very small. I think we we may have made uh, an H for Holliston, where we we're from. It may have looked like an H, but that's about as far as marching band went, you know. But that's okay. Um, and then, kind of the what really changed uh, one of the big things that changed my life was between my junior and senior year of high school, my uh, high school band director, Al Ezer, recommended me for the United States Collegiate Wind Band that was conducted by Al and Gladys Wright uh, from (laughs) Purdue, Uh, just legends in the the band world. And then, you know, circle back about 30 years later, uh, you know, I I see them again, you know, multiple times to American Band College. And uh, so that summer I went over to Europe for three weeks and, you know, with an ensemble made up of high school and some early college students. And I, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And then the following year, I decided, you know, I wanted to go into music and I had the opportunity to go out to Tanglewood to the Empire Brass Symposium. Uh, Tanglewood being the summer home of the Boston Symphony and uh, spent a month out there before my freshman year of college and that was life-changing as you can imagine and that's when I decided you know kind of studying with the Empire Brass that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life I didn't know how I was going to do it but I was going to figure it out and nobody was going to tell me I couldn't do it so yeah so you started the ensemble in 86 when did you guys really start touring you know, you got hooked up what, at first with, uh, was it Jupiter Instruments? Uh, uh, no, a- actually, well, we, we've, we, uh, we have had the, the, uh, the, the great opportunity. I mean, so many, you know, great people, as you know, in, in the music industry, uh-huh. music world. Uh, we, we first started with United Musical Instruments before uh-huh. it was even Con Selmer. Uh, right. And then, you know, once that, that joined, it became Constelmer. We were with them for a while. And then we were with, uh, with, with Jupiter. And then we're uh, incredibly fortunate to be with Yamaha for the past uh, almost four years now. Uh, so we're incredibly blessed to be with, be with them. Uh, their support of Boston Brass, support of music education is, uh, is just incredible. Um, but it, it took, before we started, I mean, we were part-time and we were just freelancing around the Boston area. We were playing graduates, graduations, weddings, church services, special events. And this is in the analog days. So it was just sending out cassette tapes and folders about your, you know, about the group and just calling everybody, you know, as many people as you could, you know, you look through the newspaper and see what's going on and just, you know, that's how it was done. And this was before we had management or an instrument sponsor. And then we got hooked up with an agency out of Minneapolis, Allied Concert Services, um, about 10 years into the band. And that's kind of when we first started touring. Um, and that's when 
a few years, about a year or so before JD Shaw had joined the group. Uh, so right. that kind of went, once JD joined, that that really changed the focus of the band. You know, uh, he brought his arranging chops, and, which which was incredible. And then just kind of we kind of looked at the whole group differently in terms of a product. We wanted to become producers of music, not just consumers of music. So that's when we memorized our show. Uh, you know, we kind of thought of, you know, the programming, everything, you know, the talking, it, kind of everything. We learned really how to be be a band. And then going out for our first tour, real tour was a month long. And that that, that teaches you how to be a band. <laughs> you know, you come out of yeah. there still talking, you're, you know, you're, you got a chance. <laughs> yeah, still talking to each other, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So obviously the coronavirus uh, has put a halt to performances for a while. And, and so Mm -hmm. tell me all the things you had lined up before this, uh, this thing hit. Well, we're still, you know, as of today, uh, you know, we're whatever, March 16th, we are, you know, still figuring things out. Um, last Friday on the 13th, we were supposed to be in Chicago for the Chicago Brass Festival. Uh, it was all a go. We showed up on Thursday and got off the plane and found out that the university had shut down. So we got back on a plane and everybody went home. Um, so, you know, it, fortunately, everything that we've had that's been canceled will be postponed. So we'll go into it next season. We were supposed to be in Austria in uh, in April. And that will happen April of 21 now. Uh, we have some concerts in Wyoming and Ohio uh, coming up and we're still, it, those will probably need to be, you know, later on in the, in the, in the season. Uh, we're supposed to make our first trip to Russia in May and uh, we're still finding out about that. That probably will be postponed. Um, so it, it is, you know, it, it's definitely, I mean, every, every group, it's just kind of, you know, shut everything down, but we want everybody you know, to be safe and healthy. And, you know, the, the virtual thing has caught on. So I have some students and, you know, just going to be doing FaceTime lessons with them. And, you know, I think everybody's just pitching in and doing what we can to keep music alive and make sure we come out of it. Okay. Yeah, you know, you've got an ensemble and you, you have to keep the ensemble together. And obviously you get together and rehearse probably for several days before you hit tours and, and things like that. Um, so what kind of advice would you give teachers who are listening in the podcast about how do you keep an ensemble together uh, from a distance, you know, without FaceTime with them? I mean, you're not FaceTime the uh, computer program, but FaceTime sitting in a classroom with them, sitting in a rehearsal hall with them. You got any suggestions that they might consider? Yeah. And I think it's, you know, for different levels, depending if you're talking middle school, high school or college, you know, there's different approaches and, you know, you're just reading on Facebook. Now everybody's trying to figure out, you know, the, 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 this online learning and what best way to do it and approach. And, you know, it's really become a community of trying to, you know, what's going to be best for the students. And, you know, I think you look at middle school students and, even high school students. I have a son who's in, uh, you know, senior in high school and, you know, they're trying to figure just life out now as a, you know, and I think just keeping them, you know, listening to music, uh, listening to recordings of the pieces you're playing in band, uh, you know, just kind of keep them, maybe give them small assignments um, on, you know, what, what to practice, make sure they have, they have their instruments. I know all the schools in Massachusetts, um, you know, that are now shut down till April 7th, that all the students are able to go in uh, today and, you know, they can go and get their instruments, you know, or they can go to school if they need to get supplies or, or whatever. So I know a lot of the schools are letting kids go in and, you know, in the band programs so they have their instruments for the next few weeks. Um, I think just be, be learning, you know, almost teaching them how to become an active uh, l- listener, you know, giving them things to listen to uh, and, you know, may- maybe to talk about and see what, you know, get suggestions on, on their instrument. Because a lot of times, a lot of these students don't, you know, if they're a bassoon player or a French horn player, they've never heard a professional bassoon player, or horn player. So they don't know what that sounds like. They may know what the person's that's sitting next to them in band sounds like, but they don't have that real sound. So giving them the opportunity, maybe suggestions 
okay, here's a list of great trumpet players, great horn players, great flute players, you know, and and, and have them listen to. So I think becoming a really uh, proactive and active listener is really important. You know, now, I mean, taking that time to teach them that and hopefully they just keep, you know, the, the horns on their faces and, you know, do a little playing. So when everybody's back, they, they just get right back into the groove again. So what trumpet players does Jeff Connor listen to? Oh, um, what, what you would think. I mean, my favorite is Doc Severinsen. Um, uh-huh. you know, Maynard Ferguson. Uh, I had the incredible privilege to my main trumpet teacher was Tim Morrison. Uh, so who is still a, a dear friend today. He comes out and conducts our uh, big band holiday show a lot, a lot um, when we're out on the road. Uh, and Tim, for all of our listeners, uh, you, you've all heard Tim Morrison play the trumpet. He was, uh, he played with the Boston Symphony and Boston Pops. He was a member of the Empire Brass. Uh, for a few years, and um, just about everything John Williams wrote that had a trumpet solo was written for Tim. So the Summon the Heroes was dedicated and written for Tim Morrison, and that trumpet solo was Tim, born on the 4th of July, uh, oh, JFK, you know, all those great trumpet solos are Tim. Um, so, I mean, he's one of my favorites. Um, uh, Clifford Brown, Winton, of course, um, I mean, just, and then, uh, you know, I just love listening to, you know, Tower of Power, Earth, Wind and Fire, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago, all those horn bands. I mean, that's, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, stuff. That, that is great. Stuff. Nothing like it. So, yeah, nothing like <laughs> it. So, so Jeff, you wake up in the morning, you say, okay, I got to go practice. Uh, and you open the case. Yes. Yeah, so, so walk us through your, your warm up routine. Warm up routine, it, it's fundamentals. You know, it, it's all working on, on, on basics, you know, long tones, lip flexibilities, uh, scales, uh, just trying to keep in shape. Um, you know, I'm kind of right now just really making sure that, you know, all within Boston Brass, our, you know, all of our responsibility is to make sure that next time we go out on the road, we're prepared. And for everybody out there who's played in a quintet, uh, you know, you think, oh, you're in great shape at home. You've been doing all the, you know, you're practicing every day and doing, putting in lots of hours and you get to the quintet rehearsal and it's like, oh my goodness, I thought I was in shape, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so, so it's just, you know, make, making sure that we're ready to go. You know, that that's why we always show up a day before, um, you know, any masterclass concert rehearsal with, with another ensemble, um, and we do a full run through of the show. We rehearse any new pieces that we uh, need to. So we make sure we're in shape uh, and then that we're ready to go for whatever we need to be doing for the, you know, the next you know, few days. Um, and so it's just, you know, it is working on a, a lot of fundamentals, working on whether we have to memorize stuff, working on new music, even music we have, you know, always trying to make it better. Uh, we've never played a perfect show. We never will p- play a perfect show. Nobody will. But we're always striving for that, you know, making it better, finding new things, you know, within the music. Um, so that's pretty much, you know, in terms of what I'm working on when I can. I enjoy playing when he allows me with my son. My son's a trumpet player. Uh-huh. Uh, so any chance I can get, you know, if he says it's OK, I get to play with him, uh, whether it's his orchestral music or jazz band music. I just, you know, I really enjoy you know playing with him. Um, so, yeah, that's awesome. Jeff, I hope you get back on the road real soon. Thank you so much, Charlie. It's been an absolute pleasure. This is an incredible, um, thing that you're doing, you know, it just, uh, th- th- this podcast and wish you all the success in the world with it and hope lots of people, you know, start listening and, you know, downloading it. It's going to be a great resource for, you know, for everybody in music. Well, we're trying to do our best and we, you know, can't, can't do this without great people like you. And uh, I'm so honored to call you my friend and I just wish you guys the best. And I know you're going to Likewise. continue to uh, influence lives through your performances and your interaction with people. And uh, hopefully our paths will cross sooner rather than later. 
Thank you so much, my friend. I, uh, you know, oh. really appreciate it. Thank you for your just continued and constant support, you know, of, of the group. It really means a lot to us. So, and, and to me personally, so we appreciate it. Okay. Talk to you soon, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Charlie. You take care. I just love talking to Jeff Connor. He is such an incredible human being. You can hear the honesty and sincerity in his voice. And he is a great person. And in addition to being a great person, he is an incredible musician. And I really love the fact that he suggested that we take time to help our students to become active listeners, providing them a list of professional musicians by instrument, giving them pieces of music to listen to, and direct their listening so that they know what to listen for. And, and when they hear that timbre, they hear that sound, they hear that artistry, it is going to make a mental implant uh, and help them as they grow in their musicianship. We're going to be right back with uh, a wonderful interview with John Armato, who talked about how his experiences in high school band have carried with him into the professional world. We'll be right back. Vandercook College Music is proud to support Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Vandercook is the only college in the nation solely devoted to the practical education of the school music teacher. If you have a student who wants to teach music, or if you or someone you know is looking for a great, practical Master of Music education program, then look no further than Vandercook College of Music in Chicago, Illinois. Vandercook also has the largest array of on-campus and online classes in their Mecca Continuing Education program. To learn more about Vandercook, visit vandercook.edu. So I'm in my, I don't know, second or third year of teaching. And uh, I go to the mailbox and, and there's a letter, hand addressed, didn't really know what this was about. And I opened the letter and it was the most beautiful letter of introduction I think I've ever received in my entire life. And it was from a young student who was coming to Winnetonka High School from Antioch Junior High School, who eloquently introduced himself and explained how excited he was to be able to be a member of the band at Winnetonka High School. That letter uh, touched my heart and uh, he became a student at Winnetonka, and to this very day, he remains a dear friend and a trusted colleague, and his name is John Armato, and John's joining us on today's podcast. John, how are you? Oh, my gosh. Charlie, you, you, just, you just kill me with that story every, every time. I know you, you told it a couple of times, and you always sort of take me off guard with that. I'm doing well, and uh, any day I get a chance to uh, chat with you is a good day. Well, thank you. And, and for those people that may not know, uh, John um, Armato is a senior vice president with Fleshman Hillard Public Relations out of Sacramento, California. And he was a percussionist. Uh, we don't want to use the word drummer because that's a bad term. <laughs> uh, so he was a percussionist in my high school band and has gone on to do many things. And most recently he has come to my aid by creating the artwork for this podcast. So John, your talents are, uh, are amazing and they are ever giving. So it's great that you're- uh, my, my, my pleasure. Great that you're joining yeah, us Yeah, no, that, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of it. You know, my, my, uh, my career started as a freelance graphic designer and, and then went into, I did, I did uh, feature writing for magazines and newspapers and, uh, that sort of thing before I got into the agency world, but um, uh, I, I don't design professionally anymore, but it's always nice to be able to sort of uh, use those skills when, when necessary. So I was happy to do it. Well, you, thank you so much. And you're, well, you're, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you're going to be a success no matter what you do. You know, you can, you can be, <laughs> be a professional car parker and you'd be an amazing success. So <laughs> that, and it may come to that. <laughs> well, no, because you, we can't get to people in this day and age. It's uh, that whole social. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get out of your car and leave it running, and I'll get to it in ten minutes. And then we'll <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. After, Just walk away after Just we fumigate away. it and all that stuff, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, 
exactly. Uh, well, John, you grew up in a family of teachers. Your father uh, was an educator for many, many years, and you have brothers and sisters that are in education. And, and really, in what you do now as a, uh, a strategist uh, for Fleshman Hillard, you know, you're always teaching clients and customers uh, about Wow, well, I, I love it that you started there. I mean, that's, uh, first of all, because I, I value that, that family background so much. Um, uh, yeah, dad was a junior high school teacher and then junior high school counselor in the Kansas City, Missouri Public School District. My brother, Mark, is a retired eighth grade history teacher. Uh, my sister, Mary, started her career uh, as an elementary art teacher. Um, my sister, Kathleen, has taught mathematics at private school for the gifted. Uh, she's taught at the university level and she's now at a private high school. Um, and uh, thanks to you, I damn near became a band director, but I, I, I swerved at the last minute. <laughs> you, you finally saw the light, in other words, huh? <laughs> But I, but you know, uh, yeah, education was a real value in my family. Um, Mom had one year of college and always wished she'd had more. Dad was the first in his family. You know, he he's the the son of of a Sicilian immigrant who came to the United States when he was sixteen, didn't speak the language, and but uh, built a business and raised a family. And Dad was the first in his family to get a degree, and in fact, to get two degrees, went on to get his master's. Uh, so it was just always a high value in the family, and. And as it relates to you know, music education, I would say in particular in our family, we all embrace the notion of liberal arts um, and the importance of the humanities and a broad, a broad range of, of uh, exposure to different kinds of ideas. And, and that was just a part of my you know, DNA from the earliest days. So you look back at when, when we were together in high school many years ago, I mean, you had the opportunity to travel with the band of the Orange Bowl, and and you had a chance to play alongside of Louis Belson in the high school jazz. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah. What, what things did you get from being a member of a high school band that you didn't get in any other class in your school? Well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this. And, uh, and to me, the, the band room experience, the band experience, and music in general, uh, I think offer kids at that level, really there's three things that it's about. There's, and I'm going to do uh, the writerly thing here and give you my three B's. You know, it, it, for me, it ended up being about beauty. It ended up being about belonging and it ended up being about basic skills for success in life. Um, and, you know, and, and I think the, uh, there's a, there's a straight line I can draw from specific band room lessons, so to speak, that I learned in high school to the success I've had in business and working with CEOs around the globe and, and uh, working with major brands and organizations. Um, a lot of those lessons are about how I learned to act, but ultimately I figured out later is also about how to lead. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the premise of my thoughts on this. Um, and, and I think the place to begin in my mind is sometimes actually overlooked surprisingly is around beauty. And, you know, I, I see things people post on Facebook about the importance of music education because it teaches you math and science and kids that are in band have higher scores here. All that's great. But the, the first value of music, in my opinion, is that music itself has value. You know, it is a beautiful thing the world needs and people enjoy and are moved by. And that's, I think, really the first thing. Um, but but we can talk about all the things. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's interesting because just this morning uh, I was uh, looking at uh, my Facebook feed and a guy had posted a video of David Maslanka, the wonderful composer who is since deceased. But it was the last mm -hmm. time he spoke, uh, I think before his death, when he was at uh, the Hart School of Music. And they were playing, I think, Symphony Number no. 4. And it's about a four-minute clip on Facebook that... I think people really need to hear. And he gets into talking about music and sound and the beauty of it. And, that, mm. and he said, at the center of every tone is peace. Mm. And boy, it That's just- That's a beautiful thought. It struck me, you know, that when we make these wonderful sounds and we, we get into music, if you really get into the center of every sound, you'll find peace. 
Uh, I love that idea. You know, I've been, I've watched a couple of Pat Metheny interviews uh, recently uh, that have been popular since the recent passing of Lyle Mays, the piano player that he was associated with for so many years. And I'm just so struck by how Pat has remained so centered on that very idea that there's that that there's something in every single note that is cause for joy, and that that's all what that's what it's about for him, and that he still can't put the guitar down before or after the concert because it's still such a joy for him. And I was I was talking to to somebody recently, um, as you know, I'm I'm working on an album. Uh, I, I still play, and I, I'm working on a an album of ballads. And um, this person I was talking to said, well, you know, what is it that makes you love ballads? And I don't know. <laughs> you know, I think, I think there's, we get hung up on um, trying to define and structure things. And the beautiful part of music is I don't know that it needs a defense. I don't know that it needs an explanation. I don't know how the, you know, how to account for the fact that there's this mechanical phenomenon of sound waves in the air that triggers this mechanical phenomenon of our eardrums vibrating, which then triggers this electro uh, electrical response in our brains that somehow makes me cry when I hear Chopin's E minor prelude or, or feel sad uh, in the third movement of the Brahms third symphony or feel ecstasy when I'm listening to first circle by Pat Metheny. I don't know. All I know is that it's just wonderful. And I'm, uh, you know, it's, it, it, to me, it's like, you know, why do you like chocolate? Why do you like sex? I don't know, but I'm grateful for both, you know? <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> well, and, 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 you know, the beauty thing has two sides to it also. I mean, let's take a look at the first side is that as a listener and we listen to music and, and every one of us on our iPods, or I guess we still have iPods or phones or whatever we have that we listen to music, yeah, yeah, yeah. have this core repertoire that we go back to. I mean, for me, it's everything from Chuck Mangione's Chase the Clouds Away uh, or Bella Via uh, yeah. or, or to Willie Nelson, <laughs> You Were Always on My Mind or to Maynard Ferguson playing MacArthur Park or Doc Severson yeah. doing something or listening to the Dvorak Serenade for Winds. I mean, you know, and, and so there's it, a it, 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 Yeah, go ahead. I see. So there's a beauty there that we have this repertoire that, that becomes very personal to us. And I'm not sure if it's, if it's the music, that's the sounds themselves, or if it's other events in our life that were happening when we were first introduced to those sounds. Yeah. You know, I've got a, I've got a, uh, an indefensible theory about that, which is that it, it may change over time. You know, I mean, you mentioned, things like Bella Via and that immediately made me smile because, because of course we paid, played that in every golden variety band performance at Winnipeg that I can recall. And uh, I have such warm memories of that. And I love that tune. Now, you know, when I first heard it and when we first played it, you know, in that moment, I, I think I was responding to the music in sort of a pure fashion. It was like, I, this was new. I was hearing it's like, Oh, that I like that. That sounds good. Uh, and then, you know, as you repeat that over the course of maybe three years, it becomes predictable, but predictably good. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm glad he's going to call that to next. Now I'm looking forward to it. And now it's got anticipation and familiarity and I get to do something I know I'm going to enjoy. And then, you know, how long have I, how, we've known each other 41 years, you know, so 41 years later, when I hear that song, it's, it's got the beauty it originally had. It has that anticipation and that familiarity that I came to expect, but now it's got that sweet nostalgia. It's got that ability to take me back in time, and I, I, you know, it transports you. and And I love it that music can can follow us in that way and grow with us and morph its meaning depending on where we are in our relationship to it. So that's a great transition to the second part of this whole beauty thing, and that is the beauty that we find as performers when we have the opportunity to play something and we know that we're playing it at well, or at least to the best of our abilities at the time, there's a certain inherent beauty and a certain inherent feeling that we get that is impossible to explain. I completely agree. I mean, you know, there's, there's been uh, books written about the concept of flow and these sorts of things, you know, what it means to be sort of, consumed by the moment 
and to be so thoroughly in the moment that time stops. Uh, and I, I've had this experience of sort of uh, being outside of myself and almost sort of an observer of me as a performer, but also so uh, inside of myself that I, you know, I sort of lose touch with things around me. Now that's, that's rare. I, to me, that doesn't happen frequently enough, but I have had those flow experiences and, um, uh, and that, that moment as a performer is, I think the thing that if you get addicted to it, that's, that's when you just can't ever walk away from music. That's something you want the rest of your life, you know, and I've, uh, I've, I've continued to play my entire life and I can't imagine not playing. Um, but, you know, what's interesting to me about what you bring up with that, a couple of things. One is a, a few years ago, I was having a conversation with uh, a, a really important person in my career, a guy by the name of John Onoda. He was one of the most experienced corporate communication guys in America. He had the top media relations job at McDonald's, the top corporate communications job at GM, Levi Strauss, Visa USA, uh, Schwab, huge companies. He's exceptionally uh, smart and talented. And he was talking about the notion of uh, personal branding. You know, what, what do you as an individual in your career stand for and, and, and uh, want to be about? And how do you go about you know, manifesting that intentionally? And I spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, you know, it's almost a cliche, but like a personal mission statement. And what is it I, I want to be in and to accomplish? And what I ultimately landed on is um, that I want to create or be a part of moments of beauty. That, that's what I want my life to be about. And that, that relates to what you're describing as that sort of performer experience. I don't want to ever give that up. But there's a, there's, a, um, there's a selfish aspect of it. It feels awesome. But there's, a, but there's a giving aspect of it, too. I want other people to have that, you know. Um, and, and what that's meant in my professional life is I seek out those moments in my work where I can give something to other people. Now that may be advice to a client, it may be professional development to staff members or what have you, but it's probably that old DNA from my dad and my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters who are educators and that desire to impart something. And to, to see the light bulb come on for someone else is as joyful for me as playing a beautiful piece of, piece of music. And, and that's something that we have to realize, especially now, seeing as though we're dealing with the coronavirus and we're dealing with uh, education in a whole new different forum and that we're having to do distance learning with our kids is that, uh, you know, it's, it may be, I mean, we may have their undivided attention right now, whereas their friends aren't mm. around to distract them in, in the classroom, you know, and, and we, can, we can hopefully impart some of these, uh, some of these life lessons to them uh, in this, in this tough time. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was, I had a, uh, you've gone to the positive and I went to the worry side. And one of the things I tell my clients is, you know, you pay us to worry on your behalf. So I, I'm usually looking for the, the risk. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and my, my fear with distance learning is that the belonging part will be harder than ever. You know, so I was to go back to, for me, what I see is the, the, what you can get out of that band experience, you know, beauty, belonging, and basic skills. The belonging piece to me is like, you know, there may be, there may be kids who, who have no interest in playing the rest of their lives, but it's, it's a tribe they find. You know, and I, and I look back and I think, you know, if I hadn't found my tribe, I don't know what I would have been doing in school. I just, I, I, I can't figure out where else I would have been or where I, where I would have found kindred spirits. And that, that idea of having your tribe, of being among people you can relate to or, or share your passion, I think is so important. And I worry a little bit now when, if you don't have 85 or 25 or 150 or whatever it is, kids in the band room, are they going to have that sense of belonging? Well, that's, yeah, they're not going to have it in that same context. But as teachers, I think it's important that we remember that our kids in the classroom gravitate to us and, and become energized when we provide them positive feedback, positive feedback mm. in, in front of their peers, especially. I mean, this helps the whole, yeah. to develop yeah. their whole self-esteem level, right? I become, I'm somebody. And, and, and they have mm -hmm. to do that now 
in the distance learning teaching too. And when, when they're putting out lessons and they're getting information from kids, they have got to not be afraid to send out something to, to all the class and go like, you know, we've been getting a lot of great assignments. We've been a lot of great. And I want to make a special shout out to, to Billy, who sent in this incredible uh, performance on his instrument. And as I keep getting these wonderful performances, I'll make sure that, you know, that, that I mention mm -hmm. that kind of thing, you know? Uh, I well, I, you know, I think that's incredibly important. And, and what you're describing is something that you were and are masterful at as a teacher. And that I know I was highly affected by that and am still influenced by it. And it's one of the big takeaways for me is I've been reflecting on the lessons from the band room, so to speak. Most of them, I think, had to do with, okay, how, how, can, how should I act as an individual for the betterment of my own uh, you know, goals? But there is that set of lessons that were really not how to act, but how to lead. And I think your gift as an educator has been that you set uncompromising standards accompanied by unwavering support. And I, I've, I've thought a lot about that over the years, and I'm known as a bit of a hard ass at the agency, um, <laughs> maybe more so in the past. I've, I, well, I am. I've, I've mellowed a little bit, but especially in my early days, you know, I was, I was pretty relentless about, no, it's not good enough, and we've got to get it better. And, but, but the thing about setting up those uncompromising standards is that you can end up really being an asshole if you're not, so if you're not helping people achieve them through your own unwavering support, you got to believe that they're capable. You got to, if they've got gaps in their technique or skills, you got to help them overcome the gaps so that they've got the facility to achieve the standards. You've got to let them, you know, and you, this is what you perhaps excel at more than anything else. I mean, speaking for myself, you believed in me before I believed in myself. Well, I and I think that that's, one of the essential roles of a teacher. Well, that's very kind. And, but, but, I, but I do think you're right. I mean, I think every child has the ability to succeed. They, they may not all succeed at the same level, but they have the ability right. to succeed. I, you know, I got a, a wonderful note from a former student who uh, I'm going to remain nameless. Uh, and I'm not sure you know him. He may have, you may have graduated before he was there, but he, he wrote and, okay. and, and basically said that he was, was uh, too young to become a member of this one band that we had at the school. But I looked at him and, and knew that he needed that experience more than maybe the band needed him. So I wrote, mm. his, I wrote his, I wrote a letter to his mom inviting him to be a member of this band. And, and he said it was the first time that my mother ever expressed how proud she was of me. Mm. Oh I, start, my gosh. I started crying as I'm reading this, uh, reading this note yeah. from this kid, you know? And, um, yeah. but, I mean, I think that's what teachers have to do. You know, we have to look at the kid and say, okay, you know, I, I kind of use this analogy that, you know, inside of every chunk of granite, there's a statue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, the question is how good of a sculptor are you? Right. And yeah. Yeah. And, now, and, and, and I've been one that's been a bad sculptor in terms of I made the wrong hit with the hammer and I completely destroyed <laughs> the chunk of granite. I mean, you know, there, there's been well, a lot. I don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. And, and to be, you know, uh, not for this to become sort of sycophantic uh, exchange, but, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever heard any stories of any kids who you destroyed with the wrong blow of the sculptor's hammer. But I do know of countless stories of my peers you know, guys and gals I, I went through band with who, as we've talked in subsequent years, have said, you know, and I'm not exaggerating, Charlie saved my life. Well, no, they don't say that. They say Mr. McGee saved my life. Uh, or he really turned me around. Or he changed things for me. He made it possible. I mean, I, 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 and, and here, here's what, first of all, it's a huge testament to you. But uh, I saw the same thing with my dad. You know, and dad's 91. Um, he has Parkinson's disease. He just, my mom passed away six months ago. He, we, he's just moved into skilled nursing care. So, you know, he's, he's struggling, but, uh, uh, when he was 90, it was, let's see, I'm trying to take this through here. Uh, I was home in Kansas city for my parents' 63rd wedding anniversary. And we had a small gathering and there were some, some cousins came over and that sort of thing. And one of my cousins 
is is dating a woman who we found out while we're sitting there chatting had dad as a counselor in junior high and she said oh you know mr armado he really he really made things happen for me he really changed my life he really helped me get it together and we used to joke as a family you know and this is 90 years old he's getting these testaments you know what i mean uh, and we used great. to joke as a family we can't go we can't go out in public as a family without somebody saying hey aren't you mr armado Oh, you, you were so good to me. You made such a difference. And then years later, as my brother, you know, had, had gone through his career. Oh, uh, that's Mr. Armada. I'm like, no, dad's not here. No, Mark Armada. Yeah, he really helped me, you know. And, and, and seeing that kind of uh, impact literally decades later, uh, well, it's emotional for me. And, and, and it makes me just sort of fall in love with every teacher that realizes that potential because that's, that's just the greatest thing in the world. Uh, I, th I think every teacher gets that from their students. They may not hear it right now. And I think what teachers have to remember is that in their heart and in their head, they have a certain set of core values and a certain set of core beliefs. And they can't, they can't compromise those beliefs. They can't compromise those That's values. Right. They have to hold, they have to hold firm to them, even, even through, some difficult times. I mean, our, we're going through difficult times right now in the world, you know, but we have to, we have to hold firm to what we think is the right thing to do here, whether it's being self quarantined or as a teacher to say, no, that's not good enough. I mean, we owe our, we owe it that much to society. We owe that much to our students, which is our like mini society that we kind of deal yeah. with. Yeah. And, uh, I completely agree. And to, and to connect the dots, because I know you want to talk about you know, how my experience has affected me in the business world. You know, I, I mentioned that I've, I've, I've been a rather rigorous taskmaster, at least in the past at the agency. And I, I remember several years ago, this was still, um, I, I, I started off in our Kansas City office at Fleshman Hillard, and then I, I was in our New York City office for four years, and now I'm based in Sacramento. Um, but when I was still in Kansas City, there was a, a, a junior member of the team. Um, she was an intern, I think, when I first started working with her, and you know, tremendous talent. And, but I, you know, I pushed pretty hard, and and there'd be writing assignments, and I'd be circling things and saying, "No, we gotta. You're missing the point here, or this needs to happen earlier, or what about this strategy that we talked about for this message, or whatever." And and, and I know she was frustrated by it. And then at some point, there was an assignment of hers that came to me, and it was great. And I just said, "Terrific work. No feedback." Give it, you know, put it back on her desk or whatever. And a few months later, I was walking by her cube and it, I saw it was tacked up on her wall. And, and it really, it really reminded me: we don't know, we can't predict the impact we're going to have. Whether it's a teacher, whether it's a manager in a business, whether it's anybody in any role in life, you can't know, you can't predict. The, there are moments that are passing and fleeting to you that are monumental and significant to the other person. And it's just impossible to know when that moment is. And that reminded me that you always have to maintain the standard because it ultimately makes a difference. Yeah. And when, and when they attain the standard or when they get to the point where you feel that they've done good work, it may not be perfect work, but it's good right. work and it shows promise and it shows better then, then that's when we have to do it. And, and if you're a, a teacher, I, I, I say this to teachers all the time. When, you know, I went to the doctor, had a, my physical examination, and we're in for the consultation. Now, here's a medical doctor, and here's a musical doctor, and we're sitting around this small table. And <laughs> he takes out his pencil, and he goes, Charlie, now let me tell you something. There are two kinds of cholesterol. There's good cholesterol, and he draws a happy face. And there's bad cholesterol, <laughs> and he draws a sad face. And he says, the most mm -hmm. important thing is to get that good cholesterol higher and that bad cholesterol lower. And I thought about that. I said, well, here we are, two doctors, and we're communicating with happy faces, <laughs> right? But <laughs> yeah. I, I thought about it, and I said, geez, as a teacher, you're walking around the room, you're hearing something you like, you grab your pencil, you write a happy face on, on their music or on their method book, I mean, my God, that opens up their world because it communicates so much more than you, oh, yeah. you played that good. I like you. You're a good yeah. person. It's a great day. Keep up the good work. I mean, the, the power of art 
you know, in, in, in such a primal form has such impact. It's pretty amazing. Oh, well, you know, you, I think you were the first person I heard say, um, uh, uh, bad news in person, good news in writing. And, and I've, I've tried to stick to that. Uh, and I try to do good news in person as well, but I'm not nearly as prolific a, a card writer as you are. It's a constant struggle and failing for me, but, but I try to write little notes to, to whomever uh, when they're really doing something that I want to re- reinforce or affirm. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I don't blow smoke, uh, but I am effusive when I want people to know just like, my gosh, you're just, you keep getting closer to that bullseye and this is great. Um, but that, I think, I think that sort of affirmation and as you say, sort of in a tangible fashion, put it on their paper, write them a note, send them a letter, you know, is, is huge. That, that stuff people save, you know, and they save it because it made a difference to them. We're going to have a little bit more with John Armato in just a second, but I do want to take this time to say thank you to all of the people that are supporting this podcast. First of all, thank you to you for listening and helping us to continue to spread the word about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. And I also want to thank our friends at Hal Leonard Corporation, Eastman Musical Instruments, Con Selmer, and Vandercook College of Music. We just can't do it without them. And in your community, you've got people that are supporting you. And I hope that during this time, you'll do whatever you can to support them. Uh, We're all in this together. And anything we can do is going to make a difference. Okay, let's get back to our conversation with John. We're back with uh, John Armato, Senior Strategist, Vice President of Public Relations and all good things at Fleshman Hillard uh, Public (laughs) Relations (laughs) Firm in, in Sacramento, California. A uh, former student, a wonderful musician, uh, an incredible thinker. And we've been talking about uh, be, being a member of a high school band and how that impacts and how it impacts our kids and how it impacts our lives and all that good thing. So, John, we talked about beauty and we talked about belonging. Um, so w- how did being a member of a, of a music program, learning to play the percussion, the drums, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How did that prepare you for the corporate world? What lessons did you take with you? Well, let me, so that's a, it's a great question, and, and I've got several answers, but let me provide a little bit of context uh, for people who may not be familiar with my industry. So Fleshman Hillard is one of the world's largest public relations firms. We're in about 80 countries globally. So whether you need communication support in Kansas City or Kuala Lumpur, we typically have an office in every major market. Um, so the scale and scope of the firm is, is huge, and I've been really fortunate in my career to work on really um, marquee kinds of clients. You know, I kind of cut my teeth on Hallmark, which uh, was a wonderful client that I worked on for 10 years, uh, H&R Block, the University of Oregon, the country of Egypt, um, a huge range. I've had a couple hundred, I think it is, roughly clients in my career. So the, the scale and scope of the firm and the profession is huge. And I've been really fortunate that I've covered a lot of ground as well. I started off in what's known as marketing communications. That was my sort of specialty. And that, that, that was the sort of thing uh, that you think of when you think of publicity, you know, getting uh, reporters to write about a new product line or, or those sorts of things. Uh, I've also worked in the financial sector and health through uh, uh, healthcare and, um, uh, a variety of, of different kinds of practices. And, and now I spend most of my time in what we call uh, corporate communications or reputation management. And this is where we're working with typically CEOs or people in the C-suite on issues of strategy and how they communicate as an organization overall. So that's sort of a, a, a sweep of, of the, the, the field I'm in. And the, uh, the work has to do with helping organizations figure out how to tell their story. Uh, in one way or the other. So recent assignments for me, I'm in the middle of helping California cherry growers figure out what the right marketing messages are in Vietnam, Japan, and South Korea for uh, selling their imports. I'm working with another industry on articulating the need to completely transform the way they market their products. Uh, I'm working with another client on... um, a public education campaign about early detection of diabetes. I do media training with uh, organizations like Fitbit and GoPro to help them prepare for presentations and 
uh, media interviews and those sorts of things. So that that sort of sets the stage for the environment in which I'm working. And uh, I would say that in, in the midst of all of that, there's a couple of really key things that go all the way back to the band room that have stuck with me. And I'd say the first one is maybe the single most important thing, which is the secret is there's no secret. And I know that's a phrase that I've heard you use, and I probably originally got it from you. But, you know, one of the things that I've come to believe is you can't fake competence, you know, um, and it doesn't come from dressing for success. It doesn't come from FaceTime and schmoozing and politicking. It comes from mastering your discipline. And if you're going to challenge the kid in first chair uh, in your second chair, you've got to be able to play that part better than the guy or gal in the first chair. And that's about competency and that's about effort and discipline and practice. And there's no other secret. There's no shortcut. And you had us doing everything that we needed to do to succeed individually and as an ensemble, whether it's winning a competition or giving a great concert or whatever. And it was always about the details. And that, that had a huge impact on me. And that's a part of why I've been a hard ass, I think, is because the details matter. We can't afford to skip over this. We can't afford to let that slide because the details, in fact, are the secret. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Don't sweat the small and stuff. I, I, and everything is the small stuff, right? <laughs> everything is the small stuff. And I, you know, I, I've, I have a bit of a reputation. I don't mean it to sound immodest, but I have a bit of a reputation as somebody who, who, uh, well, actually, I have a bit of a reputation as somebody who overthinks things, and which is the, which is the, you know, the flip side of being, uh, of, of caring about the details. Is you can sort of wrap yourself around your own shoelaces sometimes, and you know that's uh, that's something I continue to work on. But, uh, but it's all important. Um, and that, that's led to a related idea that I actually use in a lot of my professional development presentations uh, as sort of a closing idea in my session on creativity and some other things, which is excellence is not a matter of doing something extraordinary. It's a matter of mastering the fundamentals. And, and that's, that goes all the way back to the band room. You know, I mean, how are we going to do a great halftime show? Well, first of all, your, your mark time better have everybody's knees matching, you know? Um, stick height on the snare line. It's, it's gotta, it's gotta be consistent. All right. We can't even think about winning the competition until we win today. And we got to win in all of those fundamentals. You know, the doubles have got to be open. Um, the time's got to be solid or whatever the case may be. You know, uh, it, it's, that's where the excellence comes from. There's no magic thing. It's like, oh my gosh, they're, they're so good because they got that something special. No, they're so good because they mastered the fundamentals. Um, and, and I was reminded, go ahead, go ahead. I'm yeah, no, no. And, and those fundamentals, I mean, that, that becomes a whole composite of things. It's like, it's like, uh, once we allow, uh, bad behavior, we allow thoughtless behavior, we accept mistakes, we accept things that are wrong. Then all of a sudden we have blurred that line of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Whether, whether that's making sure that there's no trash in your classroom floor, that your that your your chairs and stands have been placed in a situation where somebody made a conscious decision to put them there, right? I mean, that's always yeah. what I do. That, that's that's my 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 litmus test. Is like I look at something, whether it's a piece of paper or a a, a, a project or a piece of music or somebody's classroom, and I I ask myself. Did somebody make a conscious decision to leave it at this state? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, I love listening to, uh, I've, I've checked out, you know, the other podcasts, and I love the interview you did with Kevin Leffer uh, because I, I was just so fascinated and impressed by, and I've known Kevin for a long time since you, but his intentionality, you know, no, I, I have kids do, do it this way. My area is very clean and organized because I want them not to fall prey to that sort of sloppy, you know, uh, 
less than musician status that, that drummers and percussionists have. You know, that sort of it, Kevin's intentionality in his, his teaching just blows me away. He, he has a reason. He sets out with an objective in mind. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a fundamental, you know, that's, 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 that's mastery of the fundamentals. And, and I will tell you that when he was in his studio, his students lived up to that. And when a, a new student came in and didn't live up to that, I mean, the herd got on that student, mm. that that student would either conform or find a, maybe a different major. And I, and I know, yeah. I, I know of it. I know yeah. of one kid in particular, who became a choral major uh, and not nothing against being a choral major or anything. It's wonderful. Sure. And that may have been where his heart was, but I always had this inside feeling that he got into this herd. There was a certain culture there that, that didn't fit his personality, his desire, his values, whatever it was. And he said, I'm not going to be able to succeed here. So I've got to find an area where I, I find a better match. You know? Well, you, you use the culture word, and I was just about to say, you know, in my profession, that, that's what we talk about in terms of culture and how leadership and communication all takes place in the context of culture. And culture has to be intentional. Um, now, it, culture is sort of like reputation. You know, it's something that you, ha you have no matter what. Um, it's when you are intentional about it that you shape it to what you want it to be. Um, and, and that's, that's really, that's really critically important in, in my business and in teaching. You know, when I think about this idea of success coming from mastering the fundamentals, and, and I'm not a band director, so I can't claim to know this, but I'm assuming that when you step to the podium, there's sort of a, uh, an inherent checklist that you're going through. Um, you know, is the band in tune? Are the notes right? Before we can worry about phrasing, are the notes right? You know, before, and then once we have phrasing, now can we talk about, you know, instilling emotion? And, you know, you, can, you can't go to the next level until the first level is achieved and you're monitoring all those fundamentals. That's what I'm doing in my work every day too. I can guarantee you that when we're off this call and I'm moving on to a client conversation, <clears throat> most of my conversations are going to have to do with me asking questions like, well, what are you trying to achieve? What's your objective? Well, what's your message? Well, is that defensible? Do you have, do you have proof points to that claim? I, I mean, those are the questions I ask. I've been asking for 30 years in my career. And, and I, I, you know, sometimes I think, well, this isn't this hard. I keep, you know, anyone can do this. These questions are obvious. Uh, but no, they're just the fundamentals of our profession. And you never get away from them. If you want to have great communications, you have to know what you're trying to achieve. What yeah, your you message is. Is it defensible? You have to know what, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. You know, two, two little side notes to that. I remember spending some time with Dr. Harry Beejan, who was the uh, retired director of bands at the University of Illinois. And when Dr. Beejan retired, I was at Vandercook, and we became really, really good friends. And he was working a high school band clinic at Vandercook one time. And, and he, he stopped, and he looked right at the director, and he said, if you hear a mistake – you stop and fix it. You don't let it go by. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it was that mm -hmm. uncompromising kind of, that's what you yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the other one was a kind of a, a personal story. You know, in the last, one of the f uh, earlier podcasts, I spoke with a wonderful composer, Alex Shapiro. And, and we were talking. Oh, about, that was a great interview. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, and we were talking about uh, a guy by the name of Bruce Bush at Hal Leonard Corporation. And Bruce is an incredible horn player. I mean, he went to Eastman and he was just a phenomenal mm. horn player. And I'm doing a reading session at the New York State Music Educators Conference one summer. And Bruce had brought his horn with him and he was playing horn. And so we're reading brand new band music and it's summertime and everybody's kind of casual. And I look back, straight back right from the podium and there's Bruce sitting there with his horn and he's got his leg crossed. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and so I get my hands up, and then I brought my hands down. I says, excuse me, but I said, we have a posture error in the horn section. And <laughs> Flag on the play. <laughs> and everybody kind of laughed, and, and he kind of straightened up, you know, and he never let me forget that down. He says, Charlie, that's going to cost you a scotch when this thing is over, you know? <laughs> but, I mean, I oh, mean, uh, listen, I, 
I've been on the receiving end of of, of you <laughs> in those situations. I, <laughs> I, I know it well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know, um, to try and bring this back a little bit, you know, we talk about culture, and I when I when I meet with teachers, you know, everybody goes like, "Well, do you have a set of classroom rules?" And I go like, "Why why do we always focus on the negative of it?" Why don't we talk about a set of our classroom culture? You know, this is, these are the, these are the things we aspire to, you know, instead of like, mm -hmm. don't, don't talk in class, you know, no, our, we aspire to a climate where, where people respect each other and we listen to the teacher and we do our best to contribute to the day, you know, by staying on task or something like that. Yeah. And, and if, if we uh, approach, uh, uh, I, 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 I love it that you talk about it like that. I mean, th this is this is something that I feel very strongly about. And again, you know, it's a parallel. Some of the things we're talking about, you know, we, we just find common ground between our two worlds. Some of them are things that I've brought with me from your world. But uh, uh, oh, a year or two ago, I was doing some work with a, a client um, who uh, I was helping to lead them through uh, a process of refreshing their their values statements. Actually, we did mission, vision, and values work, which is can be a little bit trite, but can be really exciting and insightful and, and productive if, if done well. And we, we spent many, many months on this. But one of the things that I believe about values, the role of the value statements in an organization, is that they, the truer they are and the more you lead from them, the less need you have for policies because the values will drive the behavior. It's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you can have an employee handbook, and you have to. There's HR reasons and liabilities and all those sorts of things. You have to have that. But as far as bringing the organization together, it's not going to come together from the policy book. It will come together from the value system. But the thing, the, the error that most organizations make in their values is they don't really stop and ask if they are true. And they don't make the distinction between, between whether or not they are a mirror uh, that they're holding up the organization, truth as we are today, or an aspiration of where we want to be. And you have to be really clear with people, just as you said, we aspire to be. That's great. But some organizations will articulate a value that doesn't exist yet. And if you don't call it an aspiration, then what, what happens is people say, um, yeah, no, that's not right. You know, if we say, well, you know, we, we're an organization that respects all people. And if that's not true, then you've, you've actually not created a positive culture. You have people saying, no, nope, that, that, ain't, that ain't true. And, but, but values, the expression of who you are, what you believe, what is acceptable and what is not, if they are really true and you can point to evidence of them in the daily life of the organization, that's the most powerful way to bring people together. John? We could sit here and talk for the next 48 hours. Because <laughs> I, I love talking to you. It's one of my most favorite things oh. in life, and you are such a joy. But we should probably uh, uh, end this for now. And uh, let me ask, will you, will you come back and we'll, we'll continue this in a future podcast? Uh, listen, you, you honor and flatter me. It is always a treat. These are the conversations I've enjoyed for 40 years, and, and we can do it for another 40 as far as I'm concerned. And uh, uh, yeah, I know. I I, uh, I I wanted to go down the rabbit hole on some of these. It, it's just it's irresistible. But uh, absolutely, always at your disposal. It's always a treat and always a pleasure. I just love talking to John Armato. He is such an incredible person, brilliant thinker, and I was so blessed to have him as a student, and even more blessed that that relationship now is. Uh, blossomed into friendship and collegiality. I respect him so much and appreciate him being on the program today. That's it for Band Talk Podcast 5. Next time, we are going to have a wonderful conversation with uh, H. Robert Reynolds, the retired director of bands for many years at the University of Michigan and most recently senior wind ensemble conductor at the University of Southern California and a guy who travels the world and is the gold standard in our band directing world. And joining Bob will be Aaron Cole, a wonderfully successful middle school teacher in Georgia who now does a lot of consulting work and band clinics and workshops for both Con Selmer and Hal Leonard. So that's Band Talk. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.
Thanks for listening to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. If you would like to send a question to Charlie or have a comment, please send an email to bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com. We hope you will let your colleagues, students, and friends know about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again soon.